is not going to do everything for you. I said, God is not going to do everything for you. I said, God is not going to do everything for you. He will reveal to you the possibilities. Say possibilities. He will deliver to you the promises. Say promises. He will even supply to you the power. Say power. But you have got to take action. Welcome to Maximize Life, the television broadcast from New Wine Church in London. Jesus said, I have come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Our mandate is to challenge you to be all you can be. So get ready to be encouraged, enriched, and empowered. You will never be the same again. Now here is your host, Pastor Michael Olaware. Welcome to another edition of Maximize Life. I am Michael Olaware, your host and the senior pastor of New Wine Church in Munich, London. Today we are looking at another life-transforming message by Dr. Tayo Adeyemi, the founding pastor of New Wine Church London, and my spiritual father who has gone home to be with the Lord. Today's message is titled, Designing Your New Beginnings. I am sure it will encourage you, it will enrich you, and without fail, it will empower you. Stay tuned. Take your Bible, please. You're in Deuteronomy. Go to chapter 1 of Deuteronomy. And we're going to read verses 6 and 8. Deuteronomy 1, 6 and 8. The Lord our God spoke to us in Horeb saying, You have dwelt long enough at this mountain. Verse 8. See, I have set the land before you. Go in and possess the land which the Lord swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob to give to them and their descendants after them. The message Bible at the beginning of verse 8 says, Look, I have given you this land. Now go in and take it. Tell your neighbor for me, God has given you your new beginning. Now go in and take it. Over the past two weeks, we have been looking at the story of Gideon, a man we identified as an unlikely hero. Remember how Gideon started out in life. He started out as a coward, started out as a loser. Gideon did not really want much out of life. He was not an action hero. He was not like Samson who will go out of his way to pick a fight with the enemy just so that he could overpower them. Gideon just wanted to be left alone. When we see him, he's threshing corn in the wine press, trying to hide it from the enemy. This guy does not want trouble at all. Like Pastor Rick Godwin said, if you were going to portray Gideon in a movie, you will not use Arnold Schwarzenegger to portray him. You will use someone like Mr. Bean. So that's who Gideon was. He was a little nobody living in a little nowhere town. But then he had an encounter with God. I said he had an encounter with God. And God called him mighty man of valor. God said, go in this your mind. He said, have I not sent you? He said, I will be with you. And from that point on, ladies and gentlemen, everything changed. When you have an encounter with God, your life can turn right around in one quick instant. Everything changed for Gideon. He could not return to business as usual, even if he tried. Why? Because he had seen a glimpse of the future. He had tasted the possibilities, and there was no way he could be the same again. Gideon's encounter with God had created within him a dissatisfaction. Say dissatisfaction. That's a very significant word today. A dissatisfaction with the way things were. Now take a look at Deuteronomy 1, 6 and 8 again. And I want you to see two things in those two verses. In verse 6, number 1, God does not want you to remain where you are. I said God does not want you to remain where you are. Verse 6 says you have dwelt long enough at this mountain. And I don't know what mountain you are dwelling at right now. But God is saying you've been there long enough. One version says this mountain has been your home for too long. For too long. The second thing I want you to see is in verse 8. 
God has prepared something better for you, but you must move in and take it. Who says amen? amen. Verse 8 says, look, I've given you this land. Now go in and take it. Ladies and gentlemen, I have discovered that dissatisfaction is one of the key prerequisites for entering your new beginning. I'll say that again. Dissatisfaction is one of the key prerequisites for entering your new beginning. If you want to enjoy your new beginning, you must develop a holy discontent, a holy dissatisfaction with the way things are. And many times, that dissatisfaction is triggered by an encounter with God. You may be listening to a message like this. It may be in your time of prayer or in your time of fasting. God reveals something to you and you cannot remain where you are anymore. A dissatisfaction is created within you. There is no point, ladies and gentlemen... In us as a church, going through what we've been through in the last two months, if the whole point is that everything will remain just the way they are. If we've been through that period of prayer and fasting, take hold of my strength. We've been through touch heaven seven times. Been through eight days of maximized life convention. Things cannot remain the same. And you will have to ask yourself, what was the point of all that if you're just going to return to business as usual? So my assignment today, my objective today is very simple. I want to agitate you. I want to provoke you. I want to make you uncomfortable. I want to provoke you to think seriously about your own new beginnings. We have come this far in the year and at this stage of the game, that phrase, new beginnings, has got to be more than just a corporate slogan. It's got to be more than just a nice appellation to the year. It's got to be more than just a nice cut phrase on the lips of members of New Wine. Now, it has got to translate into a personal experience. A personal experience. It has got to become your reality. The word, the Bible says in John 1, 14, the word became flesh. This word has got to become flesh in your own life. You have to have something tangible, something you can touch, taste, and see. Something that you can show and call your own new beginnings. And when somebody says, what does new beginnings mean for you? You must show it and say, this is what it means for me. Are you hearing me today? The Bible says faith is the substance. Say substance. The substance of things hoped for and the evidence. Say evidence of things not seen. Say it with me. Say faith is substance. And evidence. So ladies and gentlemen, faith is substance, meaning you can feel it. And it's evidence, meaning you can see it. So your faith, your new beginnings must translate into substance, something that can be touched, and evidence, something that can be seen. If the story of Gideon is anything to go by, it proves that God is not going to do everything for you. I said, God is not going to do everything for you. I said, God is not going to do everything for you. He will reveal to you the possibilities. Say possibilities. He will deliver to you the promises. Say promises. He will even supply to you the power. Say power. But you have got to take action. Get in your neighbor's face for me and tell them, take action. Oh, no, 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 that's too polite. I mean, like, get in their face and say, take action. I want you to notice that God did not summon the army for Gideon. He did that by himself. God did not fight the battle for him. He did that by himself. God did not pursue the enemy for him. He did that by himself. God assured and ensured his victory, but he had to do his own part. So God will set your new beginning before you, but you must go in and take it. Tell your neighbor, now go in and take it. So today my job is to just make you uncomfortable where you are and begin to propel you to actually take 
your new beginning. Friends, it's too late in the day. In a couple of days, we are going to be four months to the end of the year. So today, I want to plant a seed in your heart. I want you to, I want to help you move in and take what God has provided for you. You see, people of God, you will never move from where you are in life until you decide where you'd rather be. All right, that's so important. I'm going to say it again. I said you will never leave where you are until you have made a decision about where you'd rather be. So the question this morning is, where would you rather be? Where would you rather be? In your personal life, where would you rather be? In your walk with God, where would you rather be? In your family life, in your health, in your finances, in your career, where would you rather be? If you said to me, Pastor Tyre, just right here where I am, then what's the point of that whole new beginning stuff you're talking? Ask your neighbor for me, where would you rather be? And so this morning, I want to give you an assignment. I want you to leave this service today, and I want you to go to work and begin to design your own new beginnings. And what I'm going to do this morning is I'm going to put some tools in your hand. I'm going to begin to set you thinking so that you have something to work with when you start to design your own new beginnings. Tell your neighbor, today, I'm designing my own new beginning. So let's start with that question. Let's use it as a launching pad. Where would I rather be? But let's take it a little further. Let's make it more concrete. Let's crystallize it. Let's attach a time frame to it. Where would I rather be this time next year? So now, it's no longer abstract. We have concretized it. We've attached a time frame. Your time frame now is the next 12 months. Say it with me. Say the next 12 months. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. Now, you're not saying it like you understand what I want you to be thinking about as you're saying it. You're just saying words. So say the next 12 months. And I want you to begin to develop a visual picture. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. Say it again. Now nod your neighbor and say the next 12 months. Stop the person in front of you and say the next 12 months. You don't know what I did. I just helped a few people to wake up. They were sleeping. So. <laughs> say it one more time. The next 12 months. So this is the, the, this is the picture. Where would I rather be in the next 12 months? You're developing now your one-year vision. Now, the next thing I want you to do is I want you to establish six areas of focus. What did I call it? Six areas of focus. Say six areas of focus in the next 12 months. One more time. Six areas of focus in the next 12 months. So we're talking about six areas that will take your life to the next level within the next 12 months. Pastor Tyre, why six areas? Why not three? Why not 12? Why not five? Why not 15? Well, some of you know the Pareto Principle. Pareto Principle says that 80% of our results come from 20% of our efforts. Another way to say that is that Pareto said that there are half a dozen things that we do that make 80% of the difference in our lives. Half a dozen things that we do. So I want you to focus on the six difference makers in your life. The six difference makers in your life. Now, you can establish your own six areas. All I'm doing this morning is giving you a framework and putting some tools in your hand. You can establish your own six areas, but let me start you thinking. Let me give you a head start. Let me put some ideas at your disposal. Number one, spiritual. Number one, spiritual. Your spiritual life. This speaks primarily of your relationship with God. Your work with God. Then 
your spiritual growth, your ministry, and so on and so forth. Aspects of your spiritual life. Number two, family life. Family life. And this is relevant to you whether you are married or single. Whether you are young or old. Family life. Number three, your career. This could be your job, your business, your life vocation. Number four, your health and well-being. Health and well-being. Number five, your finances. Number six, your personal growth, self-improvement, your social skills, your propensity for learning. So say them with me. Say spiritual, family, career, health and well-being, finances, personal growth. Now for each of these six areas, you want to ask the simple question, where would I rather be in the next 12 months? In my spiritual life, in my family life, where would I rather be in the next 12 months? To answer that question, let's ask another set of questions. What does God want for me in these areas of my life? What plan does God have for me? Has God planned anything for me? What is in the mind of God for me? In my spiritual life. What is in the mind of God for me? In concerning my health and my well-being. If Jeremiah 29, 11 is anything worth listening to. It says God has a plan for you. Who says amen? amen. Then the big question is this. What must I do to be where I'd rather be in the next 12 months? And this is where we place the responsibility squarely on your doorstep what must i do to get to where i want to be in the next 12 months again say the next 12 months now truth of the matter is most of us are wired in such a way that we can only focus on one thing at a time i've been told that women can focus on 22 things at a time but i'm not talking about them i'm talking of us normal people <laughs> So, take each of these six areas of focus and devote two months to it. Two months to focus on your spiritual life. In those two months, pray about it every day. How often? Every day. Ask God to help you. Ask him to give you direction. Ask him to reveal to you his plans. In fact, in that two-month period, build a daily confession regarding your spiritual life. In the next 12 months, I will be, and you fill in the blanks, set specific quantifiable targets for yourself. Say specific, say quantifiable. Don't leave it in the abstract. Don't throw it up there in the open where if it happens well, fine. If it doesn't happen well, nothing has been lost. Be specific. Put yourself on the line. Take a risk. Step out. Go out on a limb. So, for example, this time next year, I will be spending one hour in prayer every day. That's specific. That's quantifiable. I can check whether that has been achieved or not. This time next year, I will be fasting once a week. This time next year, I would have read the New Testament through three times. There is no vagueness to that. There is no ambiguity. This time next year, my income would have increased by 20%. This time next year, I will be occupying the next position up on my career ladder. This time next year, I would have lost 24 pounds in weight. I don't know why that made you laugh. This time next year, I will be spending... One hour uninterrupted, one-on-one -on -one time with each of my children per week. Sounds very simple, but it's very serious. Write down those targets. Because there is power not just in speaking it, there is power in writing it down. Habakkuk 2, 2 and 3. Write the vision and make it plain upon the tablet that he may run that reads it. When you write things down, they drive you. 
They propel you. Then finally, write down one thing that you are going to do every day in order to achieve this target. And one thing that you are going to do every week in order to achieve this target. Say every day. Say every week. Ladies and gentlemen, that's how we grow. Day by day and week by week. It's not the crisis events. It's not the cataclysmic events that change our lives drastically. It's the daily decisions. Now remember, all change begins with a decision. I said all change begins with a decision. We don't make progress until we make a decision. And decision translates into creative energy. When I make a decision, God releases the energy, releases the creativity to help me actualize that decision. Now listen, friend, God has laid down the manifesto. God has set the agenda. And we cannot pretend that we don't know. God has spoken to you. Now, I'm not talking to you generally as a corporate body, as a church, to you as a specific individual. He has spoken to you during Maximize Life. He spoke to you. Pastor Tayo, but I didn't hear him. Go back and listen again. He spoke to you. It's there. With all the messages you heard, there is no doubt as to what God wants for you. But the fact that God wants it for you does not mean that you will have it. Did you hear me? The fact that God said you will be a millionaire does not mean you will be a millionaire. The fact that God said your marriage will be strong and stable and happy does not mean it will be. The fact that God said you will go around the world and preach the gospel to millions doesn't mean you will go. Are you saying then that God is a liar, Pastor Ty? No, God is not a man that he should lie. But whenever God sets the agenda, he establishes the God part. Say the God part. And he establishes the man part. Say the man part. Look at all the greatest feats, all of the greatest exploits, all of the mighty miracles we read in the Bible. There was always a God part. Say God part. And there was always a man part. Say man part. God said, I will give you the land. If he said, I will give you the land, you will think they will just sit down and the land will come to them. They had to fight. They had to kill giants. Your promise will not come to pass until you get involved. Your miracle will not become a reality until you take action. This charge I commit unto you, O son Timothy, regarding the prophecies that have gone on over you, that by them you might war a good warfare. When a promise comes, don't fold your hands and twiddle your thumbs and wait for it to drop in your lap. Do warfare with it. Take action with it. Step out and do something. Pick up the phone and make the phone call. Change something. Do something. Take action. Take action. The fact that God wants you to succeed does not mean you will succeed. God never puts succeed in your lap. He puts it within your reach. Because you see, in reaching for the success, you grow. You develop yourself. And you create the capacity to handle, to manage, and to maintain the success when it comes. Did you know if God made some of you millionaires today, it will kill you? Because you're not ready for it. Mentally, you're not ready for it. Emotionally, you're not ready for it. You haven't developed the capacity. You have not developed the maturity to handle it and to carry it. And in the process of taking action and reaching for it, God develops you. He stretches your muscles. He builds your stamina. He increases your capacity so that when it comes, you can take care of it. Are you hearing me today? And that's why we don't hand the keys to our car to a five-year-old. That's not blessing him, that's killing him. So the fact that God, doesn't, God wants it for you doesn't mean you will have it. You have to get involved. Do you want it for yourself? Do you want it bad enough that you are willing to do what it takes? I trust that this message has enriched you and challenged you to be all that you can be. If you have any questions, comments, or prayer requests about what you have heard today, do not hesitate to contact me using the details on your screen, and I will be glad to serve you as best as I can. Also, if you live in or visiting the London, Essex, or Kent area of the United Kingdom, we encourage you to come and worship at New Wine Church 
All the service details are on your screen right now. Well, till the next time on Maximize Life, God bless you.